It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I should perhaps uh, explain my status a bit more. I'm at the Free University of Amsterdam one day a week, and the remainder of the week I'm at the Dutch Competition Authority. And officially I'm wearing my Amsterdam hat here today, so this is all uh, academic. Although I will draw uh, time and again, I think, on experiences at the Competition Authority. What I do there, I'm in the healthcare division, and in, in a practical sense, over the past few years, I've been working mainly on pharmaceuticals, both on cases, uh, which I think I'm not going to name today because there are no uh, public decisions in those yet. Um, we also provide guidance. Uh, for example, we have provided uh, guidelines on collective purchasing of pharmaceuticals and uh, in an attempt to create countervailing market power there. And we've also conducted a sector inquiry into TNF-alpha inhibitors, which is a, a class of drugs that are used to fight rheumatism. Uh, my um, talk has an overly long title, and I thought at first oh, this was the fault of the organizers, but when I checked again, it turns out this was actually the, talk, the title of the paper that I wrote together with my colleagues, Kees Fontaine and Elon Acker. So I can't blame, blame the organizers. And it's not really a research paper that has been distributed in the materials but it's largely uh, practical, and I'll try to explain why we ended up writing it. Uh, what it tries to do is something new in that um, we have already discussed there is such a thing as applying the competition rules to companies that hold intellectual property rights. Uh, what we haven't discussed much today, but what also exists, is um, applying the rules on excessive pricing to pharmaceuticals and what we want to do in this paper is combine them both. So to say, um, you can apply the rules on excessive pricing to patent protected or otherwise um, benefiting from exclusivity rights undertakings. I'm going to first discuss briefly the Dutch context because I belatedly realized that you're not fully familiar with that. I will say something then about the EU antitrust rules and intellectual property, uh, but some of it has already been discussed today and I'm not going to run in any detail through the case law. I will then say something more about what I assume you'll be most interested in, which is how would you go about uh, dealing with excessive pricing in this context. I will then say something about other remedies in case uh, our excessive pricing cases fail and are otherwise in the broader context, and if there is time, I will say a few words about compulsory licensing at the end. I have a, reserve, a slide in reserve for that. We'll have to see if there's time for that. So the Dutch context is very different from the UK. Our system is not a na national health service, but it's insurance-based. Also sometimes called Bismarck system, uh, which I'm not sure is wholly appropriate. Um, <laughs> but, but that's what people call it anyway sometimes. And you have a beverage uh, system, by the way. Um, it's insurance-based, it's fully private, so both the health insurers are all fully private, all healthcare providers are private companies. And in, in addition, we have a system where drugs that have a market authorization automatically qualify for reimbursement if they're used as part of a hospital treatment. So there are no prior negotiations or anything, they just um, enter the market and can claim their reimbursement. So perhaps this is already... This already explains a little bit why we have problems with uh, high prices in the Dutch context. So the first point is that um, why we started looking at this is that we feel we have a problem with uh, pharmaceutical pricing in the Netherlands. It's certainly a political problem. It's something that plays out in the media a lot, and we see weekly discussions of this, uh, both in the newspapers and on television. So it's something that has political attention, and although we are an independent authority, that also means that it has the attention of the competition authority. I realize I'm already slipping into we from being the university, uh, Free University of Amsterdam. So uh, pharmaceuticals are also a problem because it's, um, it's a, it's a, they account for a growing share of annual health care costs. And the way I've written down the figures here probably doesn't allow you to make much sense of them, but the idea is basically that pharmaceuticals account for about 10% of the hospital budget. They're growing at 10% a year. So that means they're adding a, percent, a percentage point every year. And that's at a time when we're trying to reduce growth of hospital care funding uh, from 1% to zero over the course of the coming years. And that means that effectively, um, 
pharmaceutical products are displacing other forms of care. Now, you could have different opinions on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but it's definitely something to think about. And we like to think of it as uh, that there is at least a risk of them crowding out other forms of treatment that are equally valid. The different types of uh, pricing problems, there's repurposing of existing drugs where there has been limited new research with significant price hikes. I think we've uh, heard some of those instances mentioned here. Some of the problems are with extremely priced new patented and orphan drugs, some of which are sometimes repurposed as well. And then uh, as an order of magnitude, you have to think about drugs that might be 100,000 euros per patient per year or more, uh, going up into the 800,000 euros and, and higher still. There also is another category of drugs, and the um, TNF-alpha inhibitors are within that category. That's expensive drugs that are not, uh, at first sight, outrageously expensive because they're only between 10 and 20,000 euros per patient per year, but there are so many patients that suffer from rheumatism that it's high volume in there for that uh, reason, a problem. And in addition, and more recently, you wouldn't think we'd have a problem with low prices, uh, but we're also looking at anti-competitive discounts as well in order to, uh, where we think that originator companies may be trying to um, keep biosimilar drugs, for example, in the area of TNF-alpha inhibitors out of the market. There have been some attempts to address this by means of regulation, government intervention. There's a general price gap that we have, which is based on external reference pricing, but it's generally considered to be ineffective because it's based on the list prices in a number of neighboring countries, including the UK. And those are not actually the prices that anyone pays. So um, as a price gap, it's not very stringent because it doesn't take account of the discounts that are applied in practice. Uh, we have only limited centralized price negotiations, about which I'll say a little bit more later on. It doesn't play a very important role because um, we have those um, competing health insurers who, in principle, uh, have to negotiate themselves. And sometimes they manage. Uh, in the area of outpatients, so non-hospital treatments, there is selective purchasing by the uh, health insurers, and generally they manage to get a fairly good deal. But it doesn't really work that way for intramural, so hospital treatment patients. Uh, various things have been tried there. A system of add-on pricing, which means the hospital bills separately for the medication, so at least the insurers know what the price tag is, which is already something. We have tried as an authority, uh, the competition authorities try to promote more collective purchasing by indicating what scope there is for that within the competition rules. If anyone is interested, uh, we can discuss that perhaps separately. And um, on the menu for today, so what we're trying to do is pursue a more active competition policy. And the question is to what extent that would be compatible with intellectual property rights. So essentially, I think I already gave the game away uh, right at the beginning. There is simply parallel application of the intellectual property and competition rules. Uh, that's not something that we started out with when we wrote the paper because we uh, wanted to look at patented pharmaceuticals and ran into a lot of opposition from, strangely enough, especially economists, both within and outside our organization, who are pointing towards things like innovation and also insisting that the highest value imaginable is that of property. And here you're combining both, so you couldn't possibly uh, want to infringe on that by applying the competition rules. So they basically framed intellectual property rights as an absolute bar to antitrust. I think that's a question mark that uh, needn't be placed there anymore in view of what we've already discussed today. Uh, at the same time, we also uh, encountered a, a very cautious approach by the EU antitrust authorities. I think I'm not disclosing any secrets when I'm saying there's an ongoing dialogue between the different authorities at the different levels and the EU uh, doesn't always, at the um, community level, lead the way in every aspect. Sometimes they're more comfortable taking a back seat and following on at a later stage and perhaps a more impressive scale. I think um, what we ended up setting out in the paper is perhaps not that uh, um, innovative at all. Uh, what we essentially said was the intellectual property rights and competition rules apply in parallel, going back to the constant case, one of the early competition cases where it was held that intellectual property rights should not be used to frustrate the cartel prohibition. There's a directive on intellectual property right enforcement, which although only in a recital clearly states this does not prejudge the application of the competition rules. On the other hand, it's also clear that uh, patent is not always a relevant market, so therefore it doesn't always imply a dominant position, let alone abuse of a dominant position.
and uh, what we're effectively uh, working towards in, uh, if we look at EU competition law and industrial and intellectual property is a coexistence of the relevant principles. I'm not going to run through the case law in detail, um, but uh, what we've seen is several phases initially. There was case law to do with, um, blo with blocking parallel trade, parallel imports, and there was ruled that the existence of an intellectual property right doesn't mean there is per se dominance. Uh, at the same time, even the exercise of an intellectual property right may constitute abuse. And um, using or abusing the patent system, as we've also heard today, can form an abuse. So these are just some general principles that um, confirm that co coexistence. Um, and this phase, which is more, um, to my mind, about exclusion, um, is rounded off with the, the pay for delay cases I'm citing here, Lundbeck, Servier, and the recent generics case, where essentially it was held that restrictive agreements are possible even within the scope of a patent and that generics are potential competitors, which is an important principle that was confirmed at the highest level in the generics or peroxidin case, um, which is an interesting case in many aspects, also because it um, emphasized that um, anti-competitive effects should be balanced against proven pro-competitive effects, which I think is one of the, the most interesting aspects of the case. But from the perspective of a competition authority, it's a very welcome case. I'm sure the CMA will be very happy with it as well, uh, because it seems to confirm that, as we've heard this morning from Chris Stolders as well, um, essentially, uh, pay for delay is not um, something you should do, and is something that can clearly be caught by the competition rules. Now for something slightly more controversial so far, it's been about um, exclusion, so keeping competitors out of the market, and then the other half of competition law, at least conceptually, if not in practice, is exploitation. Countering exploitation, and there the question arises, what is a fair price? That's the, the, uh, the way that Advocate General Neil Saval started his uh, opinion in the Akala case asking that question, and eventually he did see scope for a methodology to determine such a fair price. But it's something that's rarely done, and that's very difficult. So competition law is a preference for enforcing the prohibition on exclusion for several reasons. Uh, one is a practical one. Uh, competition authorities like to stay out of price regulation because it's messy and they don't have the resources to do it. Uh, more uh, ideologically, you would say that uh, you would prefer markets to fix themselves. So if you manage to fight exclusion effectively, then that will take care of the exploitation because there will be market entry and excess profits will be competed away, as we've also heard this morning. And that would then be a market fixing itself. And anyway, what is an unfair price and how do you determine it? It's a very complicated question where there's very little guidance available so far. At the same time, um, at the national level, there has already been a move away from the pay for delay cases to excessive pricing cases. And these are uh, cases where the exploitative abuse of off patent drugs primarily was prosecuted. We've seen the Aspen case in Italy confirmed at the highest judicial level. Pfizer Flynn, about which we've heard uh, today, where we'll get interesting news on Monday. There's CD Pharma in the UK, which I believe has been confirmed at the highest uh, judicial level there. And on the back of this, um, the EG competition has started its own Aspen case, essentially in all EU member states except Italy, and therefore uh, crossing an important uh, bridge for uh, European competition law enforcement, where the Commission itself now is willing to uh, prosecute excessive prices. Um, so far, this is all uh, fairly established practice, although you could debate about what exactly the standard would be even for an off-patent drug, but clearly where there is very little innovation involved, and um, apart from the intellectual property, more procedural aspects, there is therefore no uh, reason to be particularly respectful of the product involved. This is a different matter when you move into uh, intellectual property right protected and orphan drugs. Well, uh, a few words about that. Um, our approach, or the approach that we've taken in the paper and are trying to develop also at the competition authorities, how to approach a fair price, 
is essentially by taking the incentives to innovate into account. So that is uh, the key to reconciling competition law and intellectual property law. And that um, can take pra a practical, that obviously has to take a practical aspect. There's, um, there are two phases to um, an excessive pricing proof. In the first place, you have to look at, um, at the, the margin and whether this is excessive. And you do this in a cost plus context. And next, you have to prove that the price is also unfair. And this you do it based on comparisons with preferably uh, products that are not just comparable, but also at, at, um, in competitive markets. So it provides it with a competitive benchmark. There are different degrees of uh, complexity to this. And what the uh, Competition Appeals Tribunal and Pfizer Flynn appears to have done is set out a particularly demanding and complex uh, test in this respect. And we're about to hear um, whether that uh, is appropriate or not. But in any event, it is always going to be uh, difficult because you have to look at the, uh, not just because you have to look at the figures, but also because you have to find a meaningful comparator. Limiting ourselves, ourselves to the um, intellectual property protected drugs here, what we would propose is to take a life cycle approach. So you look at the entire life cycle of the product and the degree of profitability at the various stages. Um, you should also look at the probability of success. So you cannot um, assume ahead of time that, that the um, product will, will be a success, but ideally what you need is what the company itself from an investor perspective thought that the likelihood was at which, at which it was uh, ready to invest in the product. So what you look at is the investments in innovation in there, then that also means there should be investments in innovation. So it's not enough that something would be, for example, an orphan drug that in itself doesn't prove that it's innovative. Uh, if it's an, a repurposed orphan drug, it may well be that very limited um, innovation was involved in particular if it were to be a case where the same drug had already been used off license for several decades for the treatment for which it was subsequently um, awarded an orphan status. And more technically, and I hope there are no accountants in the room uh, because I cannot uh, withstand any serious degree of questioning on this, but <laughs> what you want to do is you want to compare the internal rate of return on the one hand within the company and then look at the uh, the weighted average, average cost of capital and compare those. And essentially the next question becomes at what level would you then think an excessive price uh, occurs? And this is uh, where the jury is very much still out. Are you looking at a multiple uh, or are you looking at a percentage uh, that's smaller than 100%? Um, and those are questions where the answers may well be different if you're talking about um, innovative IP protected and or orphan drugs rather than the off patent uh, drugs found, for example, or the drug found in the Pfizer Flynn case. It might, it might be warranted to take an entirely different uh, standard into account. So um, this, I, I think, is the core of the approach that we're proposing. Unfortunately, I can't give you any examples of successful application thereof, uh, although I can assure you that we're uh, working on that. Um, and whether we'll be successful or whether we'll ever be able to come out with um, results is, is an open question. Um, in this context, there are also other issues to do with market definition and dominance. You have to look at the role of IP regulation in the context of market definition and dominance. Countervailing market power is an issue and the, in the Dutch context in particular because we have to deal with the fragmentation on the side of the uh, purchasers who are, um, who are the... Um, health insurance companies as private undertakings. Other issues are whether off-label use is part of the market, and I think uh, most people familiar with the EU um, case law on that would think that most likely it is. And uh, pharmacy preparation is another uh, live issue, whether pharmacy preparations, which can be relevant in particular to orphan drugs, whether they're very small patient populations, whether that should be seen as a substitute to be taken into account in the context of market definition and dominance determination. So that was the core of my presentation. I want to just use uh, the remaining time to say a little bit about um, other possible uh, remedies and um, the, uh, the context of the competition law intervention. Uh, there are several things you might want to look into. One is how to avoid overinvestment in social welfare terms. 
uh, where we've um, found that in some cases drugs that are incredibly expensive uh, in, in the order of magnitude of almost a million euros per uh, added healthy life here, uh, there are actually sometimes pretty good arguments in terms of the underlying costs. So you may find out that you've got something that uh, exceeds the uh, quality threshold, so that is the, the amount that you would normally be willing to pay for an added healthy life here, which in the Netherlands is uh, 80,000 euros. Uh, we've found uh, drugs costing 800,000 euros, which means they're, they're displacing for every healthy life year added, they're displacing nine uh, healthy uh, life years somewhere else. Um, but nevertheless justifiable in terms of cost, although not perhaps in terms of social welfare. So that's something you want to look at. And uh, in, more in general, the role of health technology assessment and the role of qualities and ICERs are relevant there. Uh, I don't think they probably should be a price cap, uh, nor should they be used um, necessarily as uh, the standard for willingness to pay, but they can provide a comparator across different products that may be useful if you're doing comparisons also in an, in an excessive pricing context. Uh, public pricing intervention is something that is perhaps less relevant here in the UK than it would be in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the system here is, but I think you've got more of a, uh, con more control over products entering the markets and negotiating a price before they do. Um, if we're going to keep external reference pricing, we probably want it to be uh, purchasing power parity based and also we may want it to be based on actual prices paid if available uh, rather than on list prices that nobody's actually ever paid. Managed entry agreements are something that uh, essentially involves only allowing a product onto the market after uh, you've agreed um, a pricing arrangement at the gate and horizon scanning is another mechanism that you want to introduce where you, where you know well ahead of time what's going to happen. Uh, what no products are coming onto the market and you can account for the budget implications of that. Finally, promoting competition for the market is something to look at. To look at. Uh, tendering, uh, promoting tendering, preferential sourcing and joint purchasing initiatives is something that uh, the, our competition authority has looked at has looked at and tried to promote that with the health insurance companies. Unfortunately, we have to say that so far the our results are fairly discouraging. Um, you can do that at a national scale or internationally. There's a Benelux initiatives of the Bene Benelux countries, Austria and Ireland, and I think Canada has either joined or is thinking of joining, uh, to start negotiating at an international level. Though unfortunately, it seems that so far this is me merely aspirational and hasn't actually uh, led to too many boots on the ground yet. Um, final, a final point here is that what um, we found out when we evaluated our, our joint purchasing uh, guidelines or guidance is that effective switching appears to be much more important than volume. So it's not that helpful to organize on a large scale in, because it's more difficult to reach consensus on which products than to target. But if you're even on, as a single hospital able to effectively switch your population between suppliers, that may be much more effective at the end of the day than having a large volume that is more difficult to move. Um, but I, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss maybe after um, the session any, with anyone who's interested in this kind of thing. So finally, a few words on, um, on regulation. Um, also relevant to the Dutch context, I think we need to adjust our regulation. We need to close some regulatory loopholes and gaps. Uh, we've advocated revising the orphan regime, which has basically got two uh, possible ways of entry. One is based on prevalence if you're a rare disease and the other is based on profitability if you think you couldn't reasonably make a profit. And it seems obvious and almost a drafting error that those are not cumulative uh, requirements but are alternatives. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody's ever uh, chosen the alternative route of saying um, that they couldn't be profitable, which I think in itself is already indicative. Um, and that's also the reason that they haven't dropped out of the system after six months because nobody entered it on that basis. Uh, health technology methods could be standardized at EU level, even though the cutoff or thresholds would probably have to be national. In addition, um, you could open some regulatory loopholes uh, instead of closing them. One of them is promoting pharmacy preparation. That's something that's happened in the Netherlands. And to some extent, pharmacy preparations are now becoming an alternative to uh, some of the more expensive orphan drugs. Whether, whether or not that's something that you would want to see in the long run, 
uh, is open for debate, but it's definitely a regulatory loophole that can put some pressure on the industry. Uh, compulsory licensing could be considered, uh, also as a competition remedy. I don't think I have time for that, but I have a, 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 an additional slide on that that we could discuss maybe later also after the session. Uh, what it also means uh, is that if um, application of the competition rules, in particular on excessive pricing, doesn't work, it doesn't mean that that's the end of the game. It means that we may be moving into things that nobody would really want, um, but that are nece perhaps necessary in order to create a, a more level playing field where it's possible to negotiate a new, um, more balanced outcome. So we need a more effective competition enforcement, which means developing a framework to take innovation into account, about which I've just spoken. I think we should at least try to enforce the rules, whether we're going to win our case or not. In the end, at least we have to try. Uh, developing uh, in the process experience and a certain track record in doing so. And experience has taught me that failing as, um, at enforcing the competition rules sometimes means that you win by um, finding what you wanted um, um, being introduced by means of regulation. Now whether more regulation is always the solution is a question. Uh, if we could solve it based on just the competition rules that might be preferable. And of course, there's always room for academic contributions, and I think we could shed, in particular, more light on the balance between innovation, access, and affordability, between IP rights and competition principles, as I've just tried to do a little bit. Um, then there's the issue of balancing competition and regulation that I've just touched on very lightly, and also uh, somebody mentioned Bill and Melinda Gates already. Alternative funding methods might be something uh, to study, whether that would be in the in terms of competitions or prizes or um, the dealing with publicly funded innovation in a different way is an open question. And I think I'm not going to start with the compulsory licensing, so I'll wrap it up here and thank you for your attention.